In Mesopotamian mythology, the half-man, half-fish god, Oenus, crawled out of the water to educate mankind and bring civilization to the people. Following this, the people settled into towns and cities, started growing grain, and prospered. The tale is mirrored in Syria in 2500 BCE with Dagon, a half-man, half-fish, who controlled the waters, brought wisdom to the people, and helped with the growth of grain to sustain the cities. In Ugarit, a port city in Canaan, Dagon is listed as third in the hierarchy of deities, below only El Elyon, the God Most High, and Baal Hadad, also called Adad, who lived in the clouds and controlled the rain, the wind, and the thunder. As the ancient Israelites were casting off their old gods to gain favor with the newcomer Yahweh, worship of Baal and El and Dagon waned. Still, some temples to Dagon in Judea and Israel survived much later than the Bible might have you believe, including the temple in Ashdod, which still serviced worshippers of Dagon until its destruction in the siege of the city in 147 BCE. As monotheism spread, stories of other gods were either suppressed or altered. Gods and demigods became mortal men, their miraculous deeds either downplayed or attributed to Yahweh, until they became little more than folk heroes, who were then woven into the fictive history being created to serve one priestly group or another. And of course, their names had to be changed, as they often invoked deities whose worship had fallen out of fashion. One such hero, whose exact origins are now lost, still holds a prominent place in Hebrew mythology. A demigod son of Dagon has an entire book of the Old Testament devoted to him. Of course, I'm referring to Joshua, son of the fish. I'm your host, Jason, and you're listening to Dragons in Genesis. At the end of the last episode, and at the end of Deuteronomy, Moses finally received his punishment for touching that rock without being told to. Thus, he was prevented from entering the Promised Land. He climbs atop a mountain overlooking the destination he had been looking forward to reaching for decades, and has his life ended by Yahweh. This leaves the door open for Joshua to step forward and become the leader of Israel. Yahweh summons Joshua to give him instructions to prepare for the crossing of the Jordan. The tribes of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, whose territories lie on this side of the Jordan, will send soldiers across to help clear the land of the evil Canaanites. Though why exactly their help is even needed, as Yahweh is offered to kill the inhabitants of the land himself, is never quite explained. Now before the crossing, Joshua sends two spies into the land to scout the city of Jericho, just as Moses had previously done in the book of Numbers. And the first thing they do is visit the house of a harlot. No kidding. As soon as they enter the land, they seek out the first harlot they can find and pay her a visit. This harlot must have nosy neighbors because as soon as the spies arrive, soldiers from the king of Jericho show up demanding they be handed over. But this is no ordinary harlot. She's not only clever, but more loyal to her customers than to her king. She tells the soldiers that the spies have already left, and if they hurry, they can catch the foreigners on the road. The soldiers depart in haste, and the spies exit their hiding place. Rahab the harlot tells them that she heard about Yahweh drying up the Sea of Reeds for the Israelites, and so she now worships him. They promise to spare her and her family when they finally invade and destroy the city. She tells the spies to hide in the hills for three days, at which time the soldiers will have returned to the king, and then they can escape back to their army. Everything goes exactly according to plan, and the spies return to Joshua and report that the entire land lives in fear of Israel. Now, there are a few issues with this opening scene of Joshua. First is the fact that the spies fail to spy out anything. They go straight to a harlot's house, hide from a couple of soldiers, have a quick conversation with the lady, and then depart. That's it. No other actions are mentioned in the entire scene. I suppose they fabricated the short report to cover up the fact that they went AWOL and spent all their time with a harlot instead of completing their mission. Second, how did Rahab know the soldiers would search the road for exactly three days before returning to Jericho? 
Is this a standard procedure in the region? If you're on the run, just duck off the road for 72 hours and the bounty on your head is lifted? Now, what kind of world do they live in? Are they playing Assassin's Creed or something? Such convenient knowledge only exists in bad fiction. This is not a recount of historic events. The third issue is that Yahweh has instructed the Israelites to kill every man, woman, child, and animal in the land. They are to make no deals with the inhabitants, and the reason for this is because they worship strange gods and do not know of Yahweh. Yet the first person they meet upon entering Canaan is a devout follower of Yahweh whom they strike a deal with and allow to survive, breaking every command that Yahweh has given concerning the invasion of Canaan. Rahab will not be the only native to be spared their wrath. They will strike deals with entire city-states, as we will see later in this episode. This behavior, in direct violation of Yahweh's orders, invites no punishment or even a reprimand. It's as if the writers of Joshua know absolutely nothing of the book of Numbers, and Yahweh's intolerance of those who do not follow his instructions to the letter. Lastly, there's a serious time issue here. When Rahab states that she heard about the crossing of the Sea of Reeds, she speaks of it like a recent event, not something that happened more than 40 years ago. As we saw at the end of Deuteronomy, there exists a version of the story in which the people arriving in the Promised Land were not the descendants of those who left Egypt, but those same people, and the 40-year wandering never occurred. This scene with Rahab seems to exist as a part of that narrative. We will see in chapter 24 that this isn't the only portion of the story which has multiple versions, as the chapter references a second version of the Balaam story, one wildly different from that scene in the book of Numbers. So, after camping beside the Jordan for three days, the Israelites begin their crossing. The Levite priests will carry the Ark of the Covenant, and the people will follow. Now, this also contradicts the earlier books, specifically Numbers, which has a half dozen stories about why the Levites can never become priests. Joshua is a story written by those unaware of that tradition. The tales in Exodus and Numbers about the new priestly order having sole authority haven't come into being yet. So Yahweh exalts Joshua, and the Levite priests lead the procession into the Jordan. The river stops flowing, and the people cross on dry land. Twelve stones are then placed in the middle of the river where the priests are standing. This marks the spot where they stood while blocking the water. This is likely a scene invented to explain a rocky point in the middle of the Jordan River. Now as soon as they cross the river, 40,000 troops are sent to Jericho. Then the story of the military march on the city is suddenly interrupted by a tale of circumcision. The scene states that all of the original men died in the wilderness and none of the new men have been circumcised yet, so they all cut up their penises and have to rest a few days before attacking Jericho. But what about those 40,000 that marched on the city? Did they get cut while on the march? Did they turn around and come back? Did they get to Jericho and say, Oops, my dong isn't bloody. Better march back to the river and get this done. No, there's no mention of the 40,000 shock troops who were sent ahead. It's as if this is a clumsy insert designed to convince the reader that the story actually agrees with the narrative in the book of Numbers, which it doesn't. The tale then continues on as if the entire community wasn't currently suffering in pain from genital mutilation. They all sit down and decide to celebrate the Passover. Now, if you've been following along, you'll notice that this is only the second time the Passover celebration has occurred. It's supposed to have happened 40 times since leaving Egypt, yet this is the first time it's been mentioned since Yahweh came down to Egypt and started killing children in their sleep. If those couple of inserted passages concerning the prolonged wanderings was removed, the tale would make more sense. The Israelites leave Egypt after celebrating Passover cross the Sea of Reeds, then cross the Jordan to enter the Promised Land and celebrate Passover again a year later. There's nothing in the tale that indicates a long passage of time, such as mention of their annual celebration occurring 40 times, or new heroes coming along to rise to prominence. 
Caleb and Joshua, who are present when they left Egypt, are still prominent figures when they enter Canaan. In fact, no new characters are introduced at all during the entire journey. After the circumcision scene, Joshua and company approach Jericho, where they are stopped by a stranger carrying a sword claiming to be the captain of the heavenly army. Joshua falls to his face and says, Lord, what commandest thou thy servant? The sword-bearing stranger tells him to remove his sandals because the place where he is standing is holy. Now, this is obviously an appearance of Yahweh in a scene that mirrors that of Moses and the burning bush, where he too hides his face and is commanded to remove his sandals because he is standing on holy ground. The man also identifies himself as the captain of the heavenly army, a title which alludes to the full name of Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord who musters armies. Yahweh is the captain of the heavenly host. Later versions of this story change him to a man or an angel, just as we see in other appearances of Yahweh, such as his struggle with Jacob beside the river. Bible editors don't like Yahweh walking around in sandals appearing as a human, so they change him to some other form and give him a new title. Now, after this brief interruption to the story, when they reach Jericho, Yahweh instructs them to march the army around the city blowing trumpets for seven days, shouting at the end of the process, which will bring the walls tumbling down. Now, it should be noted here that marching is considered work and is thus prohibited by the commandment to honor the Sabbath. One of those days would have been in violation of this commandment, but Yahweh doesn't seem to notice because he doesn't have them all executed for it. The walls crumbled just as Yahweh had said, and the Israelites entered the city and slaughtered every man, woman, child, and animal as commanded by their God. Only Rahab and her family are spared. The entire city is then burned down, and all of the gold, silver, and other treasure are given over to the Levite priest. Joshua issues a curse that anyone who tries to fortify the city in the future must sacrifice his firstborn in order to lay its foundations and sacrifice his youngest child in order to erect the gates. This is a reference to a Near Eastern practice to sacrifice a child when building a new city. The belief was that if you killed one of your children before major construction began, you could ensure its success. The first time we saw this was back in the book of Genesis, at the conclusion of the Cain and Abel story. Cain murders his brother Abel and spills his blood on the ground before founding the first city. And before you ask, yes, this is something the Israelites practiced before the Deuteronomic reform. How long before? That is unknown, as much of their own history has been rewritten to hide such facts. Now, before you get too upset about all the slaughter at the hands of the Israelites, it should be noted that none of this ever happened. I don't mean to say that the siege and destruction of Jericho didn't go down in exactly this manner. I'm saying it never occurred at all. The city was abandoned three centuries before the ostensible time of Joshua and rebuilt around the 9th century BCE. So, assuming Joshua actually existed, he and his army would have crossed the Jordan to discover ancient ruins that had been abandoned shortly after the Israelites began their mythic captivity in Egypt. Three centuries later, it would be rebuilt and resettled. The story of Yahweh performing a miracle to bring down the walls is nothing more than the author attempting to explain why there was a giant pile of rubble beside the Jordan. And they weren't talking about rubble which existed during the ostensible time of Joshua. But the rubble that existed after the rebuilt city was later destroyed again by the Babylonians in the 6th century BCE. Their next battle is against the Amorites. Scouts reveal the city of Ai has a small army, so Joshua sends only a small force against them. The Israelites suffer a brutal defeat and must retreat to lick their wounds. And since this is the culture that literally invented the scapegoat, they decide that their loss isn't because they underestimated their enemy, but because a single man kept some loot from Jericho for himself instead of handing it all over to the priests. The priests then tell the people that, because of his greed, 
all of Israel will be punished by Yahweh. So they execute the man along with his entire family. They are then able to defeat the Amorites at Ai with the power of Yahweh on their side. It also helps that they devise a clever ambush and show up with ten times as many men as before. But mostly it's because of Yahweh who states that he will personally kill all of the Amorites in Joshua chapter 8 verse 18. Though it's actually Joshua and his army who do the actual killing, and that is mentioned in Joshua 8.24. But this is a cautionary tale. It's invented to keep soldiers and the general population in line. If the priest demands something, you'd better pay up, or Yahweh will punish the entire land. And if that's going to happen, your neighbors are going to turn you over, and you and your family will be executed for it. Just as was the case in Jericho, every man, woman, and child was executed per Yahweh's instructions, and the king was impaled. This goes on through the entire book. The Israelites arrive in an area, conquer a city, and commit genocide. If they have trouble, Yahweh tells them he will personally deliver the enemy into their hands, but it's actually a clever tactic or overwhelming force that accomplishes the task. After the battle with Ai, all the kings west of the Jordan unite against Joshua, except for the king of Gibeon. The residents of that city all dress in rags and depart the city, taking a roundabout way to approach the Israelites. Upon arrival at the army, they tell Joshua that they are foreigners seeking a place in the promised land and will work as servants to Israel. Like Rahab, they too heard of Yahweh's recent works in Egypt and wished to join in worshiping him. So Yahweh makes peace with the Gibeonites and they move on, only to discover their true identity a few days later. Outraged at the deception, Joshua orders the entire group enslaved, but the people beg for mercy, citing the Israelites' genocidal rampage as motivation for their deception. Moved by their quaking in fear, Joshua once again spares their lives and gives them all jobs as woodcutters and water gatherers. And like Rahab, this decision goes against the command from Yahweh to make no deals with the inhabitants, but to wipe them out. Yet this incurs no divine wrath. After the treaty, the alliance of five Amorite kings all besiege Gibeon, who in turn sends word to Joshua that they are under attack. Once again, Yahweh states that he himself will deliver the enemy into Joshua's hands. And this time, he actually follows through. Sort of. They march all night and attack at dawn, aided by rocks and hailstones hurled at the enemy by Yahweh himself. Again, we see the volcano god imagery as he drops deadly boulders from the sky. Now, here's an interesting part in Joshua 10.12. During the battle, Joshua commanded the sun and moon stand still in the sky, and it happened. Now, this would just be a remnant of the old demigod legend from which the tale originated, but in an attempt to cover up its origins, the editor needed Yahweh to perform the actual feat. So what we get isn't Joshua wielding godly powers, but Joshua commanding Yahweh to perform the task and Yahweh obeying him like some obedient servant. And that's not paraphrasing. It actually states in Joshua 10.13 that Joshua commanded and Yahweh obeyed him. After the battle, the armies fled and were eventually tracked down. The kings, like all the other defeated kings in this story, were impaled. The cities were destroyed and every man, woman, and child murdered per Yahweh's command. This is repeated city after city, king after king, until they are finished. The story then spends an entire chapter, chapter 12, recounting all of the slain kings and murdered citizens. This comes out to be 31 kings in all, each the head of a burned-out city filled with the corpses of civilians and livestock. At this point, Joshua is getting too old to lead armies around, so Yahweh says he will finish clearing the land himself, and we get another recap of how all the lands will be distributed among the tribes of Israel, which wraps up chapter 13. So now that we've heard all about the distribution of the lands for the hundredth time, we won't have to go through it again. Until the very next line, when chapter 14 begins with a telling of how it is all to be distributed. 
and continues through to the end of chapter 15. During this particular recounting, we learn that the Judites didn't remove the Jebusites from Jerusalem. So we have yet another group of villainous idolaters living amongst the pious Israelites and in the holy city of all places. Okay, finally, we're done with all that. Let's move on to chapter 16. And oh my God, it's another freaking repetitive, pointless recounting of how to divide up the lands amongst the tribes of Israelites. This time, it tells us that the Manasite territory couldn't be cleared of pagans, so they were allowed to continue living there. But wait, didn't Yahweh say he would personally exterminate them all? What happened to that? Okay, so there's one exception. Well, along with the Jebusites and the Gibeonites and Rahab's family in Jericho. But that's it. Then the Josephites complain that they don't have enough land, so Joshua tells them to just clear some more. Easy, right? With Yahweh's help, they're unstoppable. But then they face the iron chariots of the Canaanites and can't win. So Joshua gives them some hill country instead. Now, Joshua assures them that with the help of Yahweh, those pesky iron chariots will eventually be cleared away and the Israelites can take the land. Perhaps it'll happen in the sequel. Spoiler alert. The book of Judges begins with Yahweh himself taking the field against the pagan Canaanites and their iron chariots, and Yahweh loses. This is found in Judges chapter 1, verse 19. So at this point, we now finally have all the territorial disputes settled and crap. Chapter 18, Territorial Disputes. Despite being told exactly where each tribe will settle about 600 times, with exact borders marked by distinctive landmarks, seven of the tribes didn't get the memo and ask Joshua about it. He sends scouts into the seven plots of land to map it all again. And they return with descriptions again that resemble those in every previous chapter going back to the beginning of time. This time, to avoid bickering about who has the best plots and who has to deal with the God-killing iron wagons, Joshua decides to leave it up to chance. So, they draw lots. Each territory is written down on a piece of paper and dropped into a black felt top hat. The leader of each tribe draws a scrap of paper and they get the exact same plots of land they were told about for the past 59 times that they mentioned this. Now, what's the purpose of this? Why did the writers of Joshua include this nonsense in chapter 18 other than to aggravate me personally? It's because they had multiple versions of the story of how different groups of people came to inhabit different regions. Why did the Bobites live in that place and the Richardites live in the other? It's because it was decreed by God. But wait, I heard that it was just random. They drew lots in the sacred tent, and those were the lots they drew. It's a classic case of multiple versions of the same story, or multiple explanations for the same situation. And the compilers included all of them, so they don't have to deal with the hate mail. It's why there are two different creation stories, two different flood stories, two different original language stories, and so on. Now, as we've discussed before, the Levites weren't a separate tribe, but a type of priest which existed in the region and were thus scattered throughout the tribes. In chapter 21, we see more evidence of this as Joshua assigns them 48 towns throughout the land. At this point, in the end of chapter 21, it states that Yahweh had given the entirety of the promised land to the Israelites, and not one of their enemies had stood against them. All of the good things that Yahweh had promised had come to pass, and everything had been fulfilled. Um, what? Isn't Jerusalem filled with Jebusites? Isn't Gibeon filled with Gibeonites? Isn't half of the promised land still filled with Canaanites riding around in armored cars with chrome spray paint on their mouths screaming, witness me? What about all those 
promises of peace and prosperity that have yet to be realized even to this day as I record this episode. What about destroying all the pagan temples so that the only temple remaining in the land sits squarely in Jerusalem and only Yahweh is praised there? For that, you'll have to check out the next episode in which we will conclude our story of Joshua and finally get into that Dagon connection that I've been teasing for months. Until then, please like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash dragons in Genesis, where you can send me any questions or comments you might have. Subscribe and give us a good review on iTunes. And as always, thank you for listening.